All right, guys, let's get started. Hi, so I'd like to introduce Harold Steck from Netflix. Um, he has a, a, a long history, I think, doing matrix and recommender system stuff. And he got his PhD from the Technical University in Munich. It was a postdoc at the AI lab at MIT and the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology and has previously worked at Bell Labs and Siemens Medical Systems. So we're very happy to have you here and very excited to hear about uh, matrices and movies. So thank you. Yeah, thank you for this kind introduction. Thank you for having me here. So at Netflix we use a lot of different models for uh, computing the recommendations for the movies. Um, but today I only want to talk about matrix factorization. That seems to be a better fit for this audience. Um, I want to talk about uh, four different uh, topics. They're all motivated by practical issues. Uh, and uh, the first one is about uh, rating data. So you can think of uh, just a matrix concerning users and items where we have the ratings that the users gave us. And uh, typically, people only think about using the rating values. But there's actually also a lot of information in effect who rated what. So basically, what uh, entries in the matrix are actually observed. So that actually contains almost more information in the rating values themselves. So I first want to talk about that. Um, this is also the basis for the remaining three parts. I want to then review the asymmetric matrix factorization. That's a nice way of dealing with the fact that actually this rating matrix concerning users and uh, movies is actually a very long and thin matrix. So that means we have many, many more users than we actually have movies. Uh, then I want to talk about uh, optimizing towards a ranking metric. Often people optimize towards the least squared uh, error. And then finally, I also want to talk about uh, computing similarity among movies. So the difference to recommendations is that recommendations typically have component of similarity, but also com component of popularity of the items. And here I want to remove the popularity component, only look at similarity. So that's a little bit more difficult problem, actually. Um, OK, so let's get started with the first part uh, by quickly reviewing the Netflix prize competition. So that ended about uh, six years ago. So maybe some people don't remember it anymore. Um, so the situation was that some ratings were given. Uh, there were 500,000 users who rated 20,000 movies. Um, and the rating val values were between five stars and one star. Five star is the highest one. You like it the best. One star is you don't like it at all. And this matrix was pretty sparse. About 1% of the entries uh, were uh, observed. And then the task was to build a recommender system. And there are basically two kinds of recommender system. So the first uh, version you could think of, it's the so-called content-based recommender system, uses the actual content features. So it means the director, the genre, the actors of the movie. And based on that, tries to predict uh, what people like. Uh, but it turned out not to work very well. So what worked actually much better is so-called collaborative filtering, where you just look at this uh, uh, rating matrix and just treat it as a kind of a matrix completion uh, problem. So you don't uh, take into account what genre the movie has, what director, and so on. Um, once you have built a recommender system, then the last step was to evaluate the recommender system based on some test data, where for some users and items there were some uh, rating values. And then uh, the evaluation was very simple. So you just take the ops Oops, you take the observed rating value, you also t which is uh, this one. You also take the uh, predicted rating value. You just take the difference, square it, sum it up. That's the root mean squared error. And the key thing here is that uh, this root mean squared error was only computed uh, concerning the observed rating values in the test set. Right? Because if it's not a value in a test set, obviously you can't compute the difference between uh, the uh, true value and the predicted value. OK, so that obviously is very easy to compute, uh, the RMSE. And it became by far the most popular uh, accuracy metric in the literature of recommender systems. But now I want to quickly show that it actually may, might not be a, a very good uh, measure. And I created here a very simplistic and extreme case where we just have uh, two kinds of users, let's say horror fans and romance lovers. And we have horror movies and romance movies. 
And the horror fans obviously watch and rate the horror movies, and the romance lovers do the same with the romance movies, but there's no overlap. So horror fans don't uh, watch and rate romance movies and the other way around. So now the task is uh, to make a prediction what to recommend to this user. Um, and there are now two hypotheses. One is you could say, okay, I want uh, a simple model that minimizes the RMSE. And obviously the simple solution is to have a model that just predicts five star uh, ratings everywhere, right? And then basically all these movies would have the same prediction. And uh, you might then recommend a horror movie to a romance lover. The other hypothesis is that there's actually some information in what people rate it, right? And, uh, and then it would actually make more sense to recommend uh, this title. So now what's actually the situation in reality? And uh, to that point, uh, Yahoo made a super interesting experiment. So uh, they collected uh, ratings in two different ways. Uh, on the left-hand side, they collected uh, the ratings in the following way. So they randomly picked 13 songs, and then they asked a user to actually give ratings for these 13 songs. So the user could not select which uh, songs to rate. So that was done by Yahoo, and they just randomly uh, did that. And because they randomized it, we can think of uh, uh, this distribution that we then get as a good approximation to the true distribution because whatever we observe is truly randomly missing or observed. And so basically, as we can see, the true distribution has a lot of very low ratings. Now in the second experiment, what they did is, uh, and that's what happens on, typically on all websites, that the user is not forced to rate a certain set of movies or songs, but you can just pick what you want to rate and then you give it a rating value. And if you do that, then you get actually this distribution of rating values. And what you can see now, if uh, the user has the freedom to choose what items to rate, then instead of giving a low rating here, they just don't give a rating at all. Okay? And so now the key challenge of uh, building a good recommender system is that we have this data for training and for testing but the user experience, uh, if they like the recommendation, actually depends on this distribution. And so this is now the disconnect. And so now what can we do about that? So that was uh, the first challenge. And uh, to just cast it in a slightly different way, so we have uh, observed ratings, which are a function of the unknown complete rating matrix and also of some missing data mechanism. Right. And uh, in the Netflix price competition, it was assumed that this is just um, missing at random. And then there's no information on what entries are observed. Um, and then it's a really easy problem. But if that's not the case, then it's more complicated. And you cannot ignore this missing data mechanism anymore. So you have to take that into account. And uh, the first step now to take into account is now to think about how can we actually measure now if the recommendations are good. And um, most metrics have a problem with that, but one metric that actually works quite well is now a, a ranking metric. So it, the idea is now that we take uh, the entire list of items. So that's the key thing now, not just to take the items for a user that uh, the user rated, but we take now all the items of a user and predict the score for each of these items. And then we rank them accordingly. And then we get a ranked list. And then we look in this ranked list, where are the uh, items that are in the test data. And if we have now rating data, we can just binarize it uh, to have uh, that we can apply a binary ranking metric. So we can just say, OK, the relevant ratings are, let's say, the five star ratings, because you definitely like those uh, movies. And all the other ratings and the missing ratings, we just uh, treat them as uh, uh, ir uh, not relevant. OK, so now only the five star ratings, we consider them as relevant uh, items for the user. And we can just see now where they end up in this ranking. and. Uh, then we can take the top K items. It depends on application. You can take the top 10 items, top three items, depending on how many you can show on your website. Um, and then out of those, in this case, three items, you can see now there are two in the top K. And so if you take that ratio, two divided by three, you get the so-called recall. That's one metric of measuring how good uh, 
your performance is and you want a number that is as high as possible. Right? So the maximum is one, obviously. Another metric is so-called precision, where you again take the two upstairs, but downstairs you just take the, the k, which is the k from the top k items. So if you take top 10, you would put a 10 here. So these are two uh, well-known metrics. Um, and uh, one interesting thing is now, if you just look at these equations, so upstairs it's the same, just downstairs they are different. Uh, so if you have now a fixed data set, then this is almost the same thing. And uh, if you have a fixed k, then this is the same. So then you can actually see that these two are proportional to each other. So that's the first thing. But the more interesting one is now, if you calculate now the recall from uh, this data that we actually have available, so which is this data, we can actually get under very mild assumption uh, a true estimate of the true uh, recall value. And the idea is that now among these relevant ratings, as I said, the five-star ratings, so we just have to assume that they are missing at random. And it doesn't matter that the other rating values are not missing at random. And the reason why it works now is because here we just have the relevant items upstairs and downstairs. And let's say we just randomly observe 10% of uh, the entries, then it would just cancel out the 10% upstairs and downstairs and it would still get uh, the correct recall number. It wouldn't work with precision because we just have the relevant items upstairs, but not downstairs. So precision would be then uh, by a factor of 10 smaller if you observe only 10%. Okay, so the key insight here is now we can actually get some results concerning the unknown uh, distribution that we want based on the one that we have by uh, calculating the recall based on all the items. And so that's now a very simple first modification that we can make to training our uh, low rank matrix factorization model. Um, so to define the model, I use a very simple model here. So we just have here the data. So in this case, uh, the rating data concerning users and items. And I just decompose it in uh, one offset value. So it's just a real number. And then two low rank matrices, P and Q. So this is now the latent vectors. This contains the latent vectors concerning the items and the latent vectors concerning the users. And the uh, standard number to use is, let's say, 50 dimensions. And uh, with this model now, uh, we can now modify the standard least squares objective function. So typically what people did is they take the least squares error, uh, so the squared error here between the model prediction and the actual rating value. And then they sum it over all users and typically over the observed items. So for the items that we observe the rating for a given user. And now the key thing is like before with the uh, recall to actually now sum over all the items. So that's the key difference. If we sum over all items, then for most items we don't have a rating value. So then what we can do is, uh, because what we know from uh, this distribution is that uh, tentatively the rating value is small when we don't observe it. So we can just impute a small rating value here, so a little rm. It's the same for every user and item. And it turns out when you do that and you try to optimize that, you find actually a rating value of 2, which makes uh, intuitively a lot of sense. Um, so now if we do this imputation here, because of the sparsity, then the sum over the items is mainly over the imputed uh, values here from which we don't really learn very much. So the next step is uh, we have a weight here. So this weight is one if it's some soft value, but it can be a very small value when this is an imputed uh, value. So the idea is by making this value very small if this is an imputed value, we can make uh, the data set more balanced again. And you can also optimize for this value, and it turns out that uh, this, the optimal value of this one for the Netflix price data is uh, 0.005. So it seems like it's close to zero. But the important thing to keep in mind is that the data has a sparsity of about 1%, and then the value we use here is, is 0.5%. So that means we actually have quite a nice balanced data set. So basically, two thirds of the weight comes from the observed ratings, and one third comes from the imputations where we are trying to take into account that the missing values are small. 
And then we have a standard L2 norm regularization where for every entry in this matrix, matrix um, we just try to force them a little bit towards uh, zero to uh, avoid overfitting. Okay. Um, one thing that I should mention is uh, now that we have a weighted uh, version here, uh, we actually have local optima here. So if the weight were one for all the entries, right, then it would be just a single value decomposition, would have one solution. Um, but with weights here, we have now local optima. In practice, it doesn't really turn out to be a big problem. And uh, in order to um, optimize this objective function, one can use alternating these squares. So the idea would be that we have this uh, data matrix given, and we can keep one of the two fixed. Let's say we keep P fixed, and then we just have to learn Q. So it's basically just a regression uh, for Q. And then after that, we do it the other way around. We keep Q fixed and uh, learn P uh, using regression. And then we can just alternate that for a while, and then it converges. Another solution is, or another approach is stochastic gradient descent. Um, and typically, everyone uses that one. But you could also use the other one. OK, uh, so if you do all that, then basically what you get now is uh, concerning uh, the ranking, the top k hit rate at different k's. So k from 0 to 1. So this is the list of all the items from uh, one item to 20,000 items. It's just normalized. Uh, as you can see now, if you take into account uh, the, uh, that the missing uh, items have low values, the RMSE actually is now much higher than with the other model, but you can see that the uh, top gate rate is now much better. And if you zoom into the top 2% of the items, you can also see that there's a huge difference between these two models. So by taking into account that the missing values are tentatively low values, uh, you can actually get a huge improvement. And um, also compared to another approach, so this was published by Yehuda Koren, maybe half a year before the Netflix competition was over. Um, and he was one of the co-recipients uh, of the Netflix prize. And uh, so he published one of his best models uh, here. And as the models get better in terms of RMSE, he showed that also they get better in terms of the top hit rate. So, so this is basically the same plot as this one. And this corresponds to that one. But as you can see, by just optimizing the RMSE on the observed values and ignoring that the missing entries actually contain also a lot of information. He gets to a certain improvement in the top key hit rate, but much, it's much lower than if you actually uh, take into account really important selection bias in the data. OK, so then uh, let's go to the next part. Um, I quickly want to uh, review the asymmetric matrix factorization, uh, which is then used in uh, the next step. So what we have is uh, we have a very long and thin matrix, right? We have a lot of users, uh, but not so many movies. Um, and uh, the problem is in the previous uh, factorization, we would have to estimate a lot of uh, parameters for this low rank part concerning the users. Because for every user, if we have, let's say, 50 dimension, we have then for half a million users. In the Netflix price data, we have to estimate 50 numbers, right? If it's a 50 dimensional <laughs> metric. So that's a lot of numbers to estimate. And given the sparsity of the data, uh, it's maybe a good idea to reduce the number of parameters to estimate. And one way of doing it is uh, oops, to express the user vector now as a sum of the latent vectors of the items that the user has actually played or rated. So now what we have to learn is only these, this matrix, which is now a matrix concerning the movies. And it has also then 50 dimensions, instead of learning a matrix concerning, let's say, 500,000 users times 50 dimensions. So this is a huge uh, reduction in the number of uh, parameters. And so we can estimate those parameters now better. But on the other hand, this is now obviously a constraint on this user vector. Uh, before that, it could be just any vector. Now it has to be expressed as a sum of these vectors uh, of the movies. So there's kind of a trade-off. You could see that maybe in some cases it's better to have not this constraint. But given that the data is pretty sparse, it actually turns out having this constraint is actually, in the end, better because it reduces the number of parameters to learn a lot. So once we have this, 
then prediction for a user and item is really easy because we just, uh, for a user, we do this summation, get this vector, and then we just multiply it with this other matrix concerning the items, and we get uh, the scores. And then we just can rank by the scores, and we are done. So the key thing also to keep in mind is that we have now two matrices concerning the items. One is the matrix Q, which is used to sum up the user vector, and the other one is the matrix P, um, which is used to compute the score by multiplying it with a user vector. So there are two different matrices. And uh, you cannot use the same in both places. That typically gives a much uh, worse results. And yeah, so I should also mention that uh, so this model was introduced by Paterak in 07 and then extended by Yehuda Core into the SVD++ by adding yet an additional term. Um, so the only thing that is a little bit more complicated now is the training. Because uh, now we have uh, a very similar equation as before. Again, these squares here. Uh, the problem is now that we sum over the users and then we sum over all the items. But for every item, we have to sum now over the items that the user has played. So that is now an increased complexity. If you have n items and n new items that the user has played, then we have a problem here. But it's quite easy, actually, to get around that. Because if you do now stochastic gradient descent, um, in order to up make updates for these uh, vectors q, we have to take the partial derivative. If we have now a data point for user u and item i, Right, we take the partial with respect to Q, J, K. And then if we do that, we can actually see that this doesn't depend on J anymore. So what we can do now is we can just aggregate that. Uh, and then only in the very end, we make one update for these Qs. So we don't have to update these Qs at every item I. We can just do that at the very end after having iterated through all of them. And that's basically here in this uh, pseudo code. Uh, so we first iterate over all the users. And then we iterate over these uh, items that the user played. And also over the, all the other ones, which we typically subsample. That's why I say random, uh, because you don't want to go through all of them. Um, and then we update the piece. But we don't update the Q matrix. So we just aggregate it here. And then after we finish this loop here, over all the items, then we have a second loop over the items that the user played, and then we update Q just with the aggregate. OK, so uh, now let's talk about uh, optimizing towards a ranking metric. So that's typically quite a difficult problem, because uh, the ranks or the ranking that you get for the items is not a smooth function of the scores that you get. Because if you have two items and they have very similar score, if one item just gets a slightly higher score, all in a sudden they change the ranking. And uh, so that makes uh, optimizing ranking metrics quite a complicated. Uh, a lot of different approaches have been developed for that. So in uh, the next maybe 20 minutes, I want to talk about an approach where I take into account uh, special properties of our feedback data. Um, and also the properties of uh, the matrix factorization model. So in order to get started, let's consider the asymmetric matrix factorization model as a neural network. Um, so this is, uh, oops. So this is now the play history of a user, right? So this is the entire catalog of items, let's say 20,000 items. And uh, now, in this part of the talk, I look at uh, binary feedback data, no ratings anymore. So binary feedback data can be, for example, if a user played something, yes or no, or if they clicked on a link, if they purchased an item. So a lot of data that we have is actually binary and doesn't have uh, rating values. OK, so this would be just a vector of zeros and ones, ones representing what the user played. So this is, again, the same matrix Q from before. So when we do that first step, then here we get the user vector, which is basically the sum of these latent vectors concerning the items that the user played. And then from here, we multiply it with matrix P, and we get our predicted scores. And now uh, we have an additional nonlinear activation function that transforms the scores into, uh, into the ranks. So then we have the ranks here. And 
once we have the ranks, we can just feed it into a rank loss function. And uh, then we are done. So now the question is, how do we optimize with respect to the rank loss function? And uh, we can just use stochastic gradient descent, where we then need uh, these uh, partial derivatives of the rank loss with respect to the model parameters. So this model parameter theta can e either be an entry in P or in Q. Just for brevity of notation, I just call it theta. And then with the chain rule, what we get is we first take the derivative of uh, the loss with respect to the rank. Then I introduce normalized the score as an intermediate step. So then the next step is uh, the derivative of the rank with respect to the normalized score, and then the normalized score to the score, and the score to the parameters. So the last step we've already done in the previous model, and this is also pretty simple, so the more interesting part are these two. Um, but let's start from uh, back to front. So the first or the last two are as follows. Um, the normalized score, so we just for a user, we look at all the scores for all the items. And we just calculate the mean and the standard deviation, and that's the normalization. So then uh, the derivative is just 1 divided by the standard deviation. Um, and the last uh, term of these four is concerning the uh, score. Uh, and the derivative with respect to a model parameter, that's also pretty simple. So if we take it with respect to p, then we just get the user vector here, which is then the sum of the q's. So, so this is pretty straightforward. So the interesting part is actually now this activation function that does the mapping from the scores to the ranks. So that's kind of the, the missing link, so that we can go from the scores to actually the lo rank loss function. And so here now I make a few. Uh, observations and make a few assumptions based on the particular properties of the data. So first thing is that I uh, assume it's a binary data. As I just said, that's actually quite common. And uh, so let's call the two uh, classes negatives and positives. And given that it's a very sparse data, mm, the vast majority is negatives and only a few positives. OK, so then the distribution of the scores is clearly dominated by all these uh, uh, negatives. So the question is now, what distribution does it have? And uh, I just assume now for simplicity that it's a Gaussian distribution. And one can also motivate it a little bit as follows. So if you again look at the score uh, that is computed based on a matrix factorization model, it's just a dot product between these two vectors. And these vectors have now a lot of latent dimensions, k. So in some sense, you can say, OK, I'm summing over. Uh, the latent dimensions, some score regarding that dimension. And so if you think about this is not just a, a sum of a lot of uh, random variables, then with a central limit theorem, you, you should get something that has close to Gaussian distribution here. OK, um, so now if we assume that we have a Gaussian distribution, um, we can do now uh, the mapping from the scores to the ranks by not using the uh, probability density function, but by using the cumulative density function, right? by just integrating it. So then it's a function that goes from 0 to 1. It's uh, this function for Gaussian. And if we have now a score, right, we can just basically go up, and then we get the quantile between 0 and 1. And if we know that we have n items, then we can just scale up from 0 to 1, from uh, 0 to n, and we basically get the rank. So then we just have also take into account that the, the top ranked item is here at the top. So we basically have to take the difference towards the top here uh, rather than going from here to here. So this is then basically the rank for an item that has a score here. OK, so dealing now with this uh, Gaussian cumulative uh, density function is numerically not nice because that's not a closed form expression. So that's why it's very convenient to make some further approximations. And one is to approximate it by this uh, blue dotted line, which is the logistic function or sigmoid function. So that's also often used in uh, neural networks. And another one that I find partic particularly simple uh, and useful in this context is actually just to approximate it by a piecewise quadrat quadratic function so that we have basically just a constant here. Then we have a piece of a parabola here, another piece of a parabola here, and then constant again. So that's the red curve. 
and that in the end actually gives uh, an approach that is actually super similar to uh, optimizing the root mean squared error because if you think about root mean squared error it would just be a parabola that also continues on the other side coming down again and you just basically cut off this part coming down and just keep it uh, constant. Um, Okay, so now the last part, so out of these four terms, the last one was the loss function. So I just want to give two examples of loss function. One is the so-called area under the curve. And uh, you can compute it uh, by just looking at all pairs of positive items and negative items. And if the predicted score of the positive one is larger than of the negative one, then they are ordered correctly. So the positive one is ranked above the negative one and you would uh, add a 1, and otherwise you would add a 0. And so basically you're just counting how often, uh, how many pairs you ordered correctly. And that also motivated a lot of ranking approaches then to be actually pairwise uh, algorithms, that they always look at a positive and a negative one and try to optimize uh, that the positive is always ranked above the negative one. Um, but what you can also do is actually quite easy to rewrite this entire pairwise expression just in a sum of uh, ranks of the positives. Or you could also write it as a sum of the ranks of the negatives. So now you actually can compute it in a linear time rather than looking at all the pairs. So, so basically then I'm just uh, following this one. And you can see it's a linear function of R. So then the derivative with respect to the rank of this loss function is super simple. It's just a constant. Um, another uh, loss function is uh, NDCG. So I picked that one because it uh, slightly different properties. So this one focuses now more on the top of the rank list. Um, as you can see now uh, here, um, the way that you actually sum up over for all the different items is now bigger if you are at the top of the list. So if you have rank one, you're just you're adding up something that is bigger than if you have something with rank 1000, for example. So this gives more weight to the top of the list, which is typically also more important in the reality because you can only show the top of the list. But again, this is also a function of the ranks of the positive items. So, and again, we can just take uh, the derivative with respect to R uh, very easily. And uh, so we are treating here basically R as a continuous uh, variable instead of uh, just a discrete one with values one, two, three, four, and so on. Okay, so now that we have uh, talked about all these four terms, um, we can go to the training. And there are basically, besides the pairwise that I mentioned, two other ways of training a model. One is the pointwise approach. So you just take for one user one item and you make an update. Uh, if you do that, you actually don't know what the standard deviation or the width of this uh, distribution of the scores is because you only have one score at a time and you are not allowed to look at the other scores. So then you could just assume that the uh, standard deviation of the scores is just a constant because you don't know anything. Uh, the other approach is the so-called list-wise approach. So now you have the entire list of items for a user. You have all the scores. And if you have that, then you can obviously calculate the standard deviation. But what you can also do is, instead of now using the score, and then mapping it to the rank via the Gaussian assumption, because the Gaussian assumption may always be a little bit wrong, uh, you can also then, given that you have all items, you can just uh, sort them, and then you immediately get directly the ranks. And uh, given that you have the ranks now, uh, the only last step that you need to do is you still need to compute this derivative of the rank with respect to the score. Um, but now what you can do is you just take the rank and say, OK, now that I have the rank, I just pretend that it uh, would have been a Gaussian distribution. And I just basically calculate what would have been the score in order to get the rank that it has. And by doing that, uh, you can do a little bit of math. And what you see is then uh, the derivative of the sigmoid. And the derivative of the sigmoid, there's an identity. It's just the sigmoid itself times 1 minus the sigmoid. And the sigmoid is actually just the normalized rank that you got from the ranking here. So then you just get actually a quadratic function here. So you don't need any exponential functions anymore in the sigmoid. Uh, so you just get uh, 
a parabola. And that basically is all you need to optimize the AUC, because AUC has a constant here. Uh, it's the derivative for the loss. And then the only part that remains is the derivative of the rank with respect to the score. And so then you have this. If you now use, instead of the AUC, the NDCG, you remember this is uh, one, one divided by the logarithm of the rank. So it's a little bit more complicated. So you get this additional term here from the NDCG. Um, and so combined with the parabola, you get some curves that look like this. So now you can see the top of the list is at 1. And so now as you get closer to the top of the list, your gradient actually increases a lot, which means it's more important that you actually get those right. Whereas if you optimize AUC, your gradient actually uh, goes down. So now you can also say, OK, a very simple compromise between the two, because AUC looks at the entire list. Um, NDCG looks more at the head of the list. So a very simple thing that is in between the two, so it looks to with some emphasis at the top of the list, is uh, just using a constant right? that's in between uh, uh, going down and going up. And uh, if you get a constant, it basically means that uh, you're using as a, as a loss something linear. So something like the linear part of the hinge loss or the linear part of a rectifier, which is used. This is used in S support vector machines. This is used in neural networks. Um, and uh, another idea is that instead of using a constant, what you could also do is uh, in the point-wise approach, where you don't know how big the standard deviation is uh, of the uh, distribution of the scores, you can just assume a very wide distribution, uh, because then you're also getting to something that is closer to a, to a constant. OK, so now putting everything together. Um, what I've talked about is this loss function, how to optimize that. Uh, this is a rank loss. And again, it's just summed over all users and all the items that the user actually has played. Because as you remember, the loss function is only a function of the positive. Uh, the rank loss is only a function of the positive items. And then it's just standard L2 norm regularization. And now there's one more part that we need is because we assumed that we have the standard uh, this Gaussian distribution of the negative scores. So far, we haven't done anything about the, the negative items. We talked only about the positive ones. And so the idea is uh, just to constrain them to be close to 0. And that's basically what happens here. So if you have some background in statistics or machine learning, so basically you just put a, put a, a Bayesian prior here so that they should have uh, a mean of 0. Uh, and uh, a little modification that I found actually works even better is that this term pulls the scores towards some positive value. Right? So there's nothing pulling the scores towards some negative value. You just try to pull the scores of the positive items up. And given that then nobody's pulling something down, you don't really have to have a prior that actually pulls uh, values uh, up. So basically, negative values don't have to be pu pushed uh, up. You just have to push the positive values down. So that's basically why this is actually with a plus. It means that if the score is uh, positive, then this is a positive number. If the score is negative, then it's 0. And with this gamma, we can now determine how wide this distribution should be. And so that's why this is important, basically, how wide the distribution is compared to how wide we assume it is over here. And uh, if we want to make this distribution very narrow, we just pick a very large lambda. And then we get this uh, approach that is more like a constant and has a little bit of an emphasis at the top of the list. And that's exactly what we see now here in some experiments on a 10 million movie lens data set. So that's a data set about uh, 10,000 movies and 70,000 users that gave some ratings for the movies. And then I just binarized it. So if it's a rating of 3 or larger, it's uh, a 1. Otherwise, it's a 0. It's also about 1% density. And now uh, what you can see here, this, these are the two list-wise approaches. 
So if we optimize NDCG that is head heavy, then recall at top 10, top 30 is the best. And if we optimize AUC, then the ranking at the top is not necessarily so good, but the AUC itself is really good. These are the point-wise approaches where I have these three different ways of approximating the uh, cumulative density, func density function of the Gaussian with basically the exact probate, the logistic or the uh, piecewise uh, quadratic function. And this W indicates that I assumed, again, this distribution is uh, very wide so that I actually get some more emphasis on the head. And you can see it's not really as good as the NDCG at the very top, but it's quite good at the top, at top 30, 80, and so on, out of uh, 10,000 titles. But, and the AUC is also not, not as good as expected as if I optimized AUC. So for comparison, so in this line, this is just the RMSE optimization that I described in the very first part of the talk uh, as a baseline. This is another baseline, which is typically used for uh, neural networks. So the objective function is to optimize cross entropy and use a softmax activation function. In the context of recommender systems, uh, it also was shown by Yu Shi that this can be understood as a top one uh, optimization or objective function. So you can see this is a little bit better than the RMSE one, but it's not really as good as the other ones here. And then the other approach is a pairwise approach that uh, optimizes AUC. And as expected, it gives good AUC results, uh, but not so good at the top. And so these numbers are the standard deviations. So I reran these experiments five times by uh, sampling the data. And so, so that's why numbers that are maybe not exactly the same, but within standard deviation, I consider them equally good. I mean, this is standard deviation that I got. And uh, I mean, they are all super similar, but I think it's still significant based on, on these standard deviations that I get by, by rerunning the experiments many times. Yeah, and so basically similar data results we also got uh, here with the Netflix play data. So that is now real play data that we have. Uh, so it's uh, run on data from a year ago. And so this is not just relative numbers, so relative to this model that I described at the very beginning. And again, you can see is that uh, the models that are supposed to optimize more the head of the distribution are doing it, uh, whereas the model that is optimizing AOC, like the other baseline model, they are a little bit better, but not really too much compared to, to this one. But the most important thing is optimizing the head anyways and not optimizing AOC. Okay, uh, so now last part, computing similarity among movies. So, uh, so the difference to the recommendations is that recommendations typically are a combination of uh, a similarity or relevance of items for user, but also popularity. But I mean, a very simple recommender system is, for example, a bestseller list. It's completely based on popularity. Uh, and now the idea is uh, to completely remove the, the popularity part and focus only on the, the relevance or similarity. And that's a little bit more difficult because often if you don't really have really good similarity, then what saves you is always the popularity because you can always just give people a little bit more popular stuff and chances are pretty high that they will like that too. Um, so there are different ways of now uh, dealing with that problem. Um, so I had some uh, paper at the Rexis conference a while ago where I just used exactly the same approach as I described in the first part, but I just uh, downweight the place of popular titles. Or what you can alternatively do is you can upweight the, the weights for the negative ones. Um, and there are also other approaches like factor analysis and graph Laplace and spectral clustering which are basically subtracting the diagonal. So I want to talk about more about the second part. And so here I want to combine spectral clustering with uh, uh, matrix factorization. So a quick review of spectral clustering, it can be understood in different ways. 
uh, one is as uh, graph cuts. So if you think about uh, movies that are just uh, connected with each other if they are similar, so for example, Ballerina is similar to Pressure Cooker <laughs> and to other dance uh, documentaries. Um, so you can just build a big graph like that. And then the idea of graph cuts is that you cut some edges so that the graph separates into uh, different clusters. And you want to cut as uh, few edges as possible. Uh, so in this case, you would cut one edge, right? And then you get two clusters. And by doing that, you can see now the similarity for this uh, title increases now, because now you got rid of the pressure cooker, but you actually uh, got now also Pina as a similar here. Right? So that's kind of a very simplistic example. Um, another question is, how do you actually find what edges to cut? And so there are different criteria. So one is the ratio cut. OK, what I should first say is that uh, this graph, you can obviously represent it is in an affinity matrix A, which just has the ones and zeros in there, ones representing that there's an edge, zeros that there's no edge. You can also have weighted edges, so then you just have some real valued numbers in here. Um, so the ratio cut is defined as just basically the weight of the edge that you actually remove or cut, divided by uh, the number of uh, nodes in the cluster. So this wants to make sure that you are not cutting off a single edge from a single node from a huge graph, because that would be a simple solution. You have to cut one edge um, if there's one node that is connected to the rest just by one edge. But that's not really interesting. OK, so it's an NP hard comp uh, complete problem to do that, but there is actually quite a, sim uh, a more efficient approximation to that. and. Uh, you can just represent the clustering result in a big matrix where you have, let's say, if you want to get k clusters, you have k rows. And every column is one data point. And you have, in one row only, you have a non-zero value. And that indicates to what cluster the data point belongs. And so what you can do is just a continuous relaxation instead of now having zeros everywhere and one non-negative, non-zero value. You just say you have continuous values here everywhere and you want to learn them. Um, and you can do that by just finding the first k eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian. And the graph Laplacian is defined as the affinity matrix A, which is subtracted by a diagonal matrix. And the diagonal matrix is just uh, the sum across, along the rows of, uh, of the matrix A. So in some sense, if uh, A contains, for example, transition counts from uh, node i to j, then D would be just uh, the popularity of item I, basically how often you are in uh, there. So basically what, what uh, happens here is you just take this uh, affinity matrix and you subtract basically the, in the diagonal the popularity of the items. Um, so this is one version of a graph Laplacian. So there are other versions. So you can let's just divide by D, then you get this one. Uh, this is basically you can interpret this one as uh, transition. If, you, if A is the transition counts, right, then this is uh, in the interpretation of a random walk, just the conditional probability of hopping from I to J. So this is another interpretation in terms of random walks. Uh, and this is the graph Laplacian that you get if you do a normalized cut instead of ratio cut. Uh, and I want to continue now with this one. Um, so what you can see is it has an exponent of 1 half. Um, so I want to talk about that in the next slide. So first, maybe a quick example. So here we have just data points. So this is a plain vanilla two-dimensional example. We have uh, these uh, data points. Uh, you can see there are obviously two clusters of data points, but it's really hard to separate them by just, let's say, a straight line, which is often done by clustering approaches. But if you do now spectral clustering, basically, you do the compute the first two eigenvectors, and then uh, you can actually plot the points of, the, of uh, these data points in this new latent space, and then they are nicely separated. And so then you could either cluster them by just uh, putting a straight line in between. Um, 
Or what you can also do is you can just do now a ranking. If you have one data point, you can just rank all the other points depending on the distance, for example. And, uh, and then you have a ranking. And that's what we want to do. We want to have a ranking. Um, but there are a few modifications that we need. Uh, so the first modification is uh, that we had this exponent of one half here in the Laplacian. And what we find is that we have a huge difference in the popularities of the items. So there's a, typically a power law, with a, and uh, some items just have many orders of magnitude, different popularities than others. So uh, one can actually derive that you can also have a different exponent here, which is closer to one. Um, so that makes a big difference. Um, the second step is um, to use a nearest neighbor graph uh, that we compute from L so that we actually make A in the end a sparse version so that we just take the nearest 10 or 40 items. Um, if we make this A sparse, one thing that happens is that uh, the results actually get much, much better. The other thing is that computations are now much faster because now we have a sparse matrix instead of a dense one. And then we can uh, very efficiently factorize it again using the same approach as I uh, described at the very beginning. And so that's basically the same objective function again that I described at the very beginning. And we just uh, minimize that. Uh, it takes a really small amount of time, just a few minutes. Then. Uh, one thing that actually turned out in this 10 million uh, movie lens data set is actually that there's another huge selection bias in the data. And what turns out is that users tend to rate movies together if these movies are, have the same release year or are very close in terms of the release year. So, so that's why I cal calculated the standard deviation of the release years for each user. Right? So are the movies that the user rated all released within a a few years or uh, spread out over many years. And what you can see, there is a huge peak here that uh, a lot of users just rate uh, movies that are within, let's say, two years or so of each other. And so now, if you just apply this machinery from before, all that you learn is actually what movies are released uh, at about the same time. And you don't really learn what are action movies, what are kids' movies. So uh, the question is now, what do you do about this? Uh, so one solution is. Uh, Obvious, so we just remove the users with a, uh, a standard deviation in the release years, let's say, small than five years to be on the safe side. But that's not really enough because also for the other users uh, that are basically in the rest over here, they still have this tendency as well. But uh, given that we actually use this pairwise affinity matrix, instead of using something else, I mean, there's also, for example, word to vec some other approaches that calculate uh, latent representation of words, for example, where you have a sentence which you can consider as a sequence of words and they take into account a larger neighborhood of a word, right? Several words before, several words after. Uh, so by doing a pairwise one where you just look at uh, one neighbor is obviously losing some information, but the advantage is here we can actually very easily correct for this uh, selection bias by just doing the following trick. Um, so for an element A, I, J, if these two movies I and J are released, let's say within a war, a zero or one years of each other, we just treat this entry as missing. So basically we put it to zero with a small weight. So this is a super simple thing to do. And uh, so I did a few uh, evaluations to see basically which uh, difference in release years is optimal, but it turned out actually using zero and one is uh, the best. And then after that, we remove too many entries in the matrix and the performance goes down. So basically, if movies are released in the same year or within one year of each other, so that seems to be the best. So if we do that, then what we get is, for example, for the Kung Fu Panda, it's Kung Fu, not fun, sorry. Uh, then instead of getting this result, which we got initially, uh, which is just other titles from the same year, we now get uh, this result, which is now a lot of other animation movies for children. Um, and also what you can see is, even though this is 2008, and we actually zeroed out this one, which is also 2008, you can still get it as a similar because of this clustering approach, right? Because we are looking if titles are in the same cluster. And if there are enough titles that are 
connected to Kung Fu Panda as well as to Horton Hears a Who, then they can still be found as uh, similars. And same thing on the Netflix price data. So here I compare to the standard matrix factorization that I described in the very first part. One way of uh, removing the popularity is also just doing cosine similarity instead of dot product to calculate how similar titles are. So basically you're just normalizing the latent vectors. So then you would get this. So the difference is that if you do this cosine similarity, you're basically taking out the popularity after the factorization, but it's more effective to take it out before the factorization. So this is the result that you get as similars for the matrix with beta equal to 0.5, which is the number for typical spectral clustering. If you crank it up to 0.9, you get this. You can see now you get already two matrix uh, sequels. And if you do then additional this re release your bias correction, then you get uh, more sequels and you get also any matrix, which is a DVD with some short movies about the matrix. Um, some other examples uh, about documentaries about the Everest. You can uh, again see that you get some Everest here, here, and uh, also here. It's a little bit more Everest than over here. Of about Andy Warhol, same thing. You get some Andy Warhol things here, and also one here. A little bit better than here. So in summary, so um, in the end, it's a lot about uh, modeling the data in the right way. And so what I wanted to show is that especially taking into account the selection biases in the data is really important in practice. Uh, so one is that the users tend to rate, to not rate items if they do not like or know them. And the other one is users tend to rate movies with similar release years. Um, I described the uh, advantages of the asymmetric MF uh, to treat, uh, to take into account that it's a long and thin data matrix. Um, I showed a very simple and effective way of uh, training towards a ranking metric. Uh, and in the end, I showed that spectral map can be used for getting similars. OK, do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Well, let's, uh, let's thank the speaker again. Maybe ask him. Yeah, sure. All right, thanks.